Good evening. Welcome to the public webinar for the Zion Canyon South Entrance Redesign Project. Before we get started, we have just a few housekeeping items we'd like to go over with you. Next slide, please. This evening, if you're having any issues with Zoom, there are two sources of help for you. You can use the online support that's available on the Zoom website. The link is in the chat and it's here on the screen right now. Or if you need more personal assistance, you can send a direct chat box message to Lily Perot and her name is there on the screen. So please reach out if you need assistance. At the end of the meeting, there will be a Q&A session with the Park Service. If you have a question that you would like addressed during the meeting, please send it in a direct chat to me, Emily Corsi. I'll be feeding them to the Park Service for their response. Please note that questions submitted during this meeting are not considered formal public comments. At this point in time, I'd like to turn the meeting over to Jonathan Schaefer. He is a public information officer for Zion National Park. All right, well, thank you, Emily. And good evening, everybody. My name is Jonathan Schaefer. And on behalf of myself and everyone here at Zion National Park, I want to thank you for taking time to join us this evening. I'm glad to be joined by our park superintendent, Jeff Bradybaugh, our chief of facilities management, Dr. Bry Carter, and our resource management and research division lead, Aaron Dempsey. We're looking forward to sharing information with you about the improvements the National Park Service is proposing for Zion National Park's south entrance area. To begin our one hour meeting, Superintendent Brady Ball will take a minute to welcome all of you. Then you'll hear a presentation from Aaron Dempsey about the environmental planning process. After that, Bry Carter will describe the improvements we're considering near the park's south entrance. To conclude, Aaron Dempsey will describe some of the important park resources we've analyzed during the planning process. After the presentations are done, we've set aside about 30 minutes to answer your questions. Please type your questions in the meeting chat and we will address them after the presentations. We will not be taking questions audibly, but we will be sharing a recording of the presentation after we conclude. We'll be sharing the link with you to the National Park Service's Park Environmental and Public Comment website throughout the presentation so that you can submit formal comments and also take a look at some of the documents that we're referencing. So now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Superintendent Jeff brady -Bot. Thanks, Jonathan. Good evening and welcome to our virtual public meeting. If you're familiar with the park's south entrance area, you may be aware of several projects in recent years designed to better manage traffic congestion and address safety issues in the entrance area. The first phase was to modernize and rebuild the entrance stations, followed by a project to increase the lanes and area approaching the entrance stations. The next phase, the project we're describing tonight, is located just beyond the entrance stations inside the park and leading to the Zion Canyon Visitor Center with road, parking, trail connections, and related improvements proposed. The current road configuration past the entrance stations results in traffic congestion, user group conflicts, and shuttle system delays. In this area, people may be traveling by foot, manual or power-driven mobility devices, bicycles, e-bikes, cars, commercial buses, vans, RVs, and park shuttle buses. The limitations of existing infrastructure in this area result in confusion and potentially unsafe conditions for visitors and employees. We hope to resolve these conditions. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. We look forward to your thoughtful suggestions during the public comment period. Thank you, Superintendent brady -Bot. And now to address the purpose of the proposed project, hear more about what we are proposing. Our resource management division lead, Aaron Dempsey, will share a presentation. If you want to read the presentation later, 
You can see it on the National Park Service's Park Environmental and Public Comment website. And we will share a link to that website in the meeting chat. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them in the meeting chat and we will answer as many as possible after the presentation. We anticipate that our presentation will last about half an hour and the question and answer session will last until about 7 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Whether you ask a question during the presentation or not, we encourage you to follow up by submitting formal comments about our proposed improvements online. It's easiest for us to receive those comments online. Uh, we can also share information about how you can mail us a letter. But so that you know what you can share comments about, now to share a little bit of information about the park's proposal, go ahead, Aaron Dempsey. Great, thanks so much, Jonathan. And thank you all for being here tonight. It's great to see so many folks on and interested in hearing about our project. So as I'm sure most of you on the call know, uh, the Zion Canyon South Entrance is located in the Southern portion of Zion National Park near the town of Springdale, or just to the, to the edge of Springdale, I guess. About 70% or the majority of our visitors enter the park here. So as you can imagine, it's a pretty busy area and I'm sure you've experienced that as well. On this map, the park boundary is outlined in red, and the star indicates the south entrance area, which is the, the proposed area of effect in this project. Once visitors go pass through the entrance stations, much of the traffic coming into the park makes a right turn and crosses a two-lane bridge across the north fork of the Virgin River. This bridge provides access to Zion Canyon Visitor Center, Watchman Campground, and other park amenities on the east side of the Virgin River. I think that's the next slide for us. There we go. The current configuration of the south entrance, as the superintendent has just shared with us, results in significant congestion. We see a lot of vehicular traffic with cars, RVs, tour buses, and park shuttle buses, as well as many visitors traveling by foot or on mobility devices, on bicycles, and even on e-bikes. As you can imagine, or perhaps have experienced yourself, the conflicts that arise between these various user groups, or a lot of conflicts arise between these various user groups, especially when the park is, is really busy. Uh, as, as you know, now we're getting into the busy season, so um, we're starting to see these effects more and more. The limitations of the existing infrastructure in this area have resulted in confusing and potentially hazardous layout for both visitors and employees. So to evaluate this problem and come up with a potential solution, the park entered into a planning process through the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA. The NEPA process helps us make sound decisions that are based on understanding the environmental consequences of our projects. It helps us ensure we do our best to act in a way that protects, restores, and enhances the environment. As part of that process, we have prepared an environmental assessment, or EA, for the project. We'll introduce the broad outline of that document tonight, but we encourage, highly encourage everyone to go online and read the document in its entirety as it goes into much greater detail than we're able to get into here. As Jonathan has mentioned, you can find it on the National Park Service's Park Environmental and Public Comment website. In general, the EA describes the project or what it is that we propose to do, why the project is needed, what the environmental impacts may be, and provides a list of agencies and persons with whom we consult throughout the planning process. The analysis of potential impacts helps us determine if we can issue a document called a finding of no significant impact, also known as a FONSI, or if the proposed project would result in significant impacts if we need to prepare a document called an environmental impact statement. Prior to issuing a FONSI or deciding to prepare an EIS, the EA must be made available for public review and comment. We are currently in that public review window and we'll go into more details uh, about this particular step of the process toward the end of the presentation. In general, or overall, I guess, the purpose of the proposed Zion Canyon South Entrance Redesign Project is to 
improve circulation and safety for vehicular, bicycle, and pedestrian traffic, create pedestrian connections through the area and provide more intuitive wayfinding, modernize science facilities and utility infrastructure, and address compliance with ABA and ADA. We feel the project is needed because the existing road infrastructure and alignments were not constructed to accommodate current levels of visitation. Zion now records nearly 5 million annual visits. Additionally, the existing conditions create dangerous traffic situations resulting in harmful interactions between vehicles, bicyclists, and pedestrians. We considered a range of alternatives to solve these issues, which are described in further detail in Appendix A of the EA. Tonight, Bry Carter, our Chief of Facilities Management, will discuss the two alternatives carried forward for further analysis in the EA. The first is what we refer to as a no action alternative, and the second is the proposed action and preferred alternative. At this time, I'll turn it over to Bry to take it away. Thanks, Aaron. Um, under alternative A, or the no action alternative, as Aaron mentioned, uh, the park would continue to um, uh, manage the south entrance as it exists today. The existing two lane road and two lane bridge would continue to provide the access to the visitor center. The existing shuttle bus parking and the maintenance area uh, would remain a patchwork of surfaces as it is today and uh, large vehicle and employee parking areas would not be expanded. And I'll explain this further in the next slide. Um, in describing the current um, situation and under alternative A, I'll give you two scenarios. One, the first one will be uh, a visitor entering the uh, the south entrance. And if I might have cursor control, that would be helpful. Okay, I will try to describe this uh, for you. At the uh, south entrance fee stations, a visitor comes in. Let's say this visitor is a, a pickup truck towing a camper. And uh, they process themselves through the uh, south entrance fee station with the help of our fee station operators, and they exit the fee stations. At this very moment, they need to make a decision as to which direction they will be going. They will, they will continue on the Zion Mount Carmel Highway toward the east entrance of the park, or they will turn right um, heading toward the visitor center. At the intersection, leading up to the intersection to turn right to the visitor center, um, it, it's quite important to understand what's going on in the driver's position, uh, especially someone who is in a large vehicle or towing a vehicle. Uh, this person needs to be able to see at the right hand side, especially uh, from their driver's position in order to make a right hand turn they'll need to cross over in some cases, uh, other traffic flows exiting the fee station area. So this is a, an initial point of uh, conflict um, in traffic flow. Once the uh, uh, driver successfully navigates that and does make that right turn onto Watchman Campground Road, they head toward the um, Watchman Campground Road bridge. Um, as they, uh, move toward that bridge, they first encounter one crosswalk uh, that is um, moving people and cyclists and other modes of non-vehicular uh, travel uh, onto the Perus Trail uh, from the visitor center uh, and often are needing to pause uh, for that um, to clear. This backs up traffic toward the fee stations. Just after that crosswalk, as they enter and are now on the bridge, uh, right at the exit of the bridge, there is another crosswalk. And again, the same scenario occurs and we start to get an accordion effect 
uh, for traffic um, continuing to back up. Um, after that crosswalk, the uh, visitor continues on the road and encounters an intersection. And this particular visitor, uh, the example is that they want to park in the large vehicle parking area. And at that intersection, they need to pause for uh, traffic uh, coming from the visitor center to exit the park or from the Watchman campground to, to exit the park. Um, and they need to be uh, vigilant uh, regarding the three crosswalks in the area. And uh, so before turning left, uh, there, there can be quite a delay. Um, and perhaps uh, there are visitors who, uh, who enter a crosswalk and stop the flow of traffic coming out of the Watchman campground and the visitor center areas and enable that left turn to take place. But just prior to that left turn, the driver needs to be cautious of that crosswalk um, before entering the large vehicle parking area road. So they make that left-hand turn and then they eventually make a left-hand turn into the large vehicle parking area. Uh, scenario number two is a shuttle bus. And this shuttle bus is coming down the Zion Mount Carmel Highway from within the park. And they approach that same large intersection uh, that people encounter just after the fee stations. Uh, we're on the same slide. Thank you. Um, and they, as they approach that intersection, they get into the left-hand turn lane and now they are pausing, waiting for traffic uh, coming through the fee stations uh, to clear so they can make a left-hand turn. Once that, um, that throughway is clear and they, they then encounter the same two crosswalks as our visitor experience um, and uh, can be delayed before entering the visitor center's shuttle stop area, which is a right-hand turn just after that second crosswalk, which is near the exit, if you will, of the Watchman Bridge. And the, the shuttle driver then drops off uh, passengers and picks up a new load of passengers at the visitor center shuttle stop, and uh, then uh, uh, exits the shuttle stop area, pausing at that intersection that we discussed before also needing to make a left-hand turn. And so there can be a delay there, especially when there is a stream of traffic coming from the fee stations toward the visitor center um, in combination with uh, the traffic coming out of the campground and the visitor center. So two-way uh, traffic, vehicular traffic flow um, and um, and it, that can be quite a delay caused there. So eventually the, uh, the driver finds it clear to make a left-hand turn, perhaps because again, uh, pedestrians are in that uh, crosswalk that prevents, if you will, traffic from exiting the visitor center parking lot or the Watchman campground. And the shuttle continues back over the bridge, pausing at those two crosswalks for the, for the same reasons, um, in addition to possibly experiencing a delay uh, caused by pedestrians and other non-vehicular traffic on the roadway bridge, would have, which has a very limited um, uh, span of concrete curbing on just one side and really no room on the other side of that bridge for those pedestrians, forcing those pedestrians into the roadway itself and causing significant uh, significant delays in that area. Uh, and the, as the shuttle bus passes uh, through those two uh, crosswalks, can then uh, make a right-hand turn and continue back up Canyon on the Zion Mount Carmel Highway. Now I'll present the, uh, the proposed alternative. This is alternative B. 
And uh, under alternative B, the preferred alternative, this, this includes constructing a new roundabout, uh, basically just after the fee station area. You can see the annotation on the left-hand side of the screen stating fee station to orient you. And what you see here is, um, is a rather large uh, traffic circle um, and a new four lane vehicular bridge, a four, a two lanes uh, each way. Uh, there's also a pedestrian underpass in the lower portion of the blue area that's indicated uh, that goes under the roadway bridge in that you can see that that trail loops around and does connect to the, the new bridge. So under the, just a quick note, under the alternative A or no action, there is no other way to get to, for example, the South Campground or to the uh, Perus Trail, except to walk on the roadway bridge itself. That existing bridge, which is in um, faint uh, gray to the left of that new four lane bridge. Uh, so that pedestrian uh, uh, pathway crosses over the, the new bridge in its own designated and separate from the traffic flow position. Um, the work would include uh, realigning, as you can see here, the Zion Mount Carmel Highway and the Watchman Campground Road. Also, uh, to the left of the upper portion of the blue area in the picture, you can see that faint uh, exhibit of the existing roadway. That roadway would be uh, in that area would be revegetated, graded to existing grades. And um, uh, this work also includes removing that existing bridge across the North Fork of the Virgin River to restore that channel um, to its natural conditions. And I might add also that the new bridge has a longer span and Aaron can get into um, some of the uh, benefits to that uh, span, or we can address those questions, those formally submitted questions uh, later. Uh, okay, next slide. Uh, this uh, schematic drawing of the proposed bridge um, is intended to be as compatible as practical for the historic architectural characteristics in the area and throughout the park. Um, this image shows a car uh, traversing the bridge with the, um, with the uh, sandstone cliffs in the background. Uh, the foreground shows uh, the river bank uh, sloping downward toward the, uh, the rushing water. Also, you might note on either side of the river, there is uh, a riprap or large boulders placed on either side to help prevent with a, uh, erosion in the area. You see that underpass I spoke about before with pedestrians uh, approximately to scale there. So quite a bit of room for our pedestrian cyclists to um, traverse that area under the bridge, staying completely now out of the way of traffic flow. Um, so uh, let's see, next slide then. All right. So continuing on with some of the uh, proposed construction activities, this is the area after crossing over the new four lane bridge. And we see yet another traffic circle. This traffic circle is intended to improve the flow and the safety um, for visitors, uh, shuttle, stop, shuttle buses, um, and all forms of traffic in the area. The, um, the second roundabout there is um, also provides better flow and access to the large vehicle parking area, as well as for our shuttle buses to uh, ingress and egress from the shuttle maintenance facility. The uh, the um, 
construction also includes trail connections to the Perus Trail, to the visitor center, um, and to the employee uh, parking lot. With both the in purple, you can see the large vehicle parking area and the employee parking area, indicating um, expansion of those uh, areas to uh, aid in um, providing more parking spaces in the visitor center parking area itself by removing any uh, employee parking from the, that area. It also, uh, you can see a trail uh, leading from the employee parking area toward the visitor center to provide um, a safe uh, passage for our employees to get to and from work. It also includes grading all of these areas to existing grades. And uh, of course, uh, an essential element of all of this is proper signage, fencing, pathway lighting, um, just to better define the pedestrian routes and uh, decision points for vehicular traffic, as well as stormwater drainage culverts as needed. Next slide. Okay, so let's go back to those two scenarios and we'll, re we'll refer to our first one, the visitor with the, uh, the trailer, the camping trailer. Now they exit the fee stations and you can see there as they approach the traffic circle, there are two lanes approaching that traffic circle. That is not, um, a forcing function for people to make a decision. Now they have two opportunities to still get to the visitor center. You, you might not notice it there in that graphic, but um, any visitors who happen to find themselves into the traffic circle area, first and foremost, they're only yielding to oncoming traffic in the traffic circle, but they have an option to continue right, even if they enter the traffic circles. They are not forced to go around and around in the traffic circle to get to the visitor center. And they're not forced to continue up the Mount Carmel, Zion Mount Carmel Highway. Um, also is a dedicated uh, right of that lane that does get them directly to the traffic uh, leading toward the visitor center. So now there are two lanes coming down to the new bridge and there are no crosswalks on either side of the bridge now. And um, shuttle buses can immediately begin uh, transitioning to the rightmost lane. After they cross over the bridge, they can, uh, they can immediately turn right and go into that uh, visitor center, sh center shuttle stop. As noted here, connect shuttle stop to new access road is the uh, moniker in white lettering. Um, so the traveler with the, uh, with the RV continues straight and eventually merges into a single lane that enters that second traffic circle. And prior to entering the traffic circle, of course, yielding to anyone uh, that would be coming around to perhaps do a loop in that traffic circle for some reason, but generally for the large majority of time, that visitor with that trailer uh, enters almost immediately uh, with a quick yield to traffic and can make a decision to take the first exit to the visitor center parking lot, the second exit to the Watchman campground, or the third exit to that large vehicle parking area. Again, having no conflict with crosswalks or uh, and only yielding to traffic initially upon entering the traffic circle. They're able to, let's say they, they continue in our previous example. Uh, they still want to go to the large vehicle parking area. So they um, they when they exit the uh, let's see that would be the third exit on that traffic circle. They're directed immediately toward that large vehicle parking area. Now they're only needing to uh, negotiate that 
intersection just prior to the large vehicle parking area. Uh, should any shuttle buses be coming out of the facility area or any uh, ve large vehicles that may be exiting the, um, the large vehicle parking area that just need a little bit of room or some, some patience before that person turns left into the large vehicle parking area. Now to our second scenario, the shuttle, the shuttle driver is uh, coming down Zion Mount Carmel Highway. They slow to enter the traffic circle. They, um, they yield to any oncoming traffic, which would be coming only from uh, within the traffic circle uh, uh, for vehicles um, coming from the fee stations or from the visitor center or watchman campground area. Uh, once, upon entering the traffic circle, um, exiting at the second exit, which uh, brings them down across the uh, bridge. And as I mentioned before, they can now immediately take a right-hand turn uh, without needing to stop uh, for pedestrians into that shuttle stop area. Once they unload and then reload, they exit that shuttle stop uh, area and they negotiate, they yield to oncoming traffic, they enter the traffic circle and continue on with their, their, um, their movement through the traffic circle and uh, exit out the uh, rightmost lane of that uh, four lane bridge and the, the two lanes exiting. And they can immediately continue having a right of way, right of way in that rightmost lane not needing to enter that first traffic circle uh, and continue back up Zion Mount Carmel Highway. So uh, with those two scenarios um, in the uh, no action and the preferred alternative provided, I'll now turn it back over to Aaron. Great, thank you, Bri. So just as a quick note, the in the EA document itself that is located on that Park Environmental and Public Comment website that Jonathan has mentioned, the EA alternatives um, that Bri just described can be found in Chapter 2. Chapter 3 then describes what's referred to as the affected environment, which includes uh, existing or baseline conditions and expected future conditions. The EA analyzes the potential beneficial and adverse environmental impacts, effects that could occur when we're implementing our alternative. While we considered and dismissed several other impact topics, the five that we're uh, going to talk about tonight that are noted here on your screen, um, th those are the ones that we were carried forward for further detailed analysis. So over the course of the next few slides, I will very briefly uh, describe the impact that the alternatives could have on these specific resources, as well as possible mitigations uh, that we can put into place to help us avoid or minimize those impacts. A list of the proposed preliminary mitigation measures can be found in Appendix B of the EA. So um, starting with vegetation, the project area includes a very complex mix of developed zones, disturbed grasslands, and native vegetation communities. Under alternative B, vegetation would be removed to construct the new roundabouts, the new road alignments, new vehicular and pedestrian bridge, and the reconfigured large vehicle lot. To mitigate the impact of, of removing all of that vegetation, Prior to construction, the Zion Vegetation Program, uh, which is our very talented bunch of folks um, who, who deal with all of the vegetation here in the park, they will go in and salvage the native vegetation and save that for future replanting. Following construction, the disturbed areas will be completely revegetated, uh, keeping in mind the natural spacing, uh, abundance of plant life, and diverse, diversity of uh, native plant species found elsewhere in Zion Canyon. Another uh, resource that we analyzed are the Mexican spotted owls. 
The Mexican spotted owl is listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. These owls are often found in steep-sided canyons with old growth mixed conifer forests. And they're usually in those locations, nesting on cliff ledges or in caves along canyon walls in the very deep, shady, and cool parts of the canyons. The upper photo on this slide shows an owl that is brown with irregular brown and white spots who is perched on a cliff ledge. The bottom photo shows a juvenile owl with downy, fluffy white feathers. Zion is lucky enough to have some of the highest densities of Mexican spotted owls known in Utah, and the entire park is designated as critical habitat for this species. As part of the planning process for this proposed project, Zion conducted formal Endangered Species Act consultation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The details of that consultation are included in Appendix E of the EA. As a mitigating measure, uh, if a Mexican spotted owl is observed within the project area during construction, work comes to a stop, and then the project area is resurveyed daily uh, until the, the owls are confirmed to have left the area. So no work would continue while an owl is noted in, in the area of work. Going on to visitor use and experience, um, alternative B, which again is the preferred alternative, would benefit the visitor experience by resolving issues with both safety and circulation. During project implementation, we certainly expect there to be disruptions. Uh, visitors would experience temporary disruptions to traffic flow, temporary traffic control measures, and increased noise, uh, un unfortunately. To mitigate the impact to the visitor experience, the park will proactively share information about what visitors can expect, as well as possible disruptions, We'll make sure we send that out to, to both visitors and the local community so that everybody's in the know about what to expect as they, as they come to the park. The park typically coordinates these types of communications and messaging through press releases, website updates, and social media posts. Moving on to cultural resources, in alternative B, the existing Watchman Campground Bridge, which is a historic structure, would be removed. The park is consulting, uh, actively consulting with the Utah State Historic Preservation Office to develop an agreement so that we appropriately record the bridge's character and history. To mitigate the adverse effect of removing the bridge in its entirety, as Bri mentioned just a little bit ago, the new bridge design will be in keeping, it will include some of the, the existing historic architectural elements um, that you can see elsewhere in the park. Additionally, uh, one, of the, one of the positive benefits of the proposed bridge design, or the, the new bridge and its design, uh, is that the bridge abutments will be outside of the 100-year floodplain, which is a huge benefit uh, to water resources. The, I'm sure as many of you are aware, the North Fork of the Virgin River is designated a wild and scenic river. The proposed project would involve, would involve work within and adjacent to the river. And as a result, the park will complete a Wild and Scenic Rivers Act Section 7 determination. In that document, we will analyze the effects of bridge construction and the effects that that may have on the river's free flowing conditions, water quality, and outstandingly remarkable values, which are all under consideration in the Wild and Scenic River Act and the, the Virgin's designation as such. Uh, a floodplain statement of findings has already been prepared for this project and can be found in Appendix E, or I'm sorry, Appendix F of the EA. This document outlines the potential floodplain impacts and the mitigation measures associated with the preferred alternative. That document, the floodplain statement of findings, is also available for public comment at this time along with the EA. So you can find it on that uh, Park Environmental and Public Comment website. One mitigation to protect our water resources dictates that all equipment working in the waterway will be inspected and cleared of invasive species prior to its entry into the work site. In water work, water directly in the river itself will not occur, may not occur, from April 1st to July 31st in order to protect sensitive fish species. 
Um, also, when not in use, construction materials may not be stored within the 100-year floodplain. So that's just sort of, like I said, a quick overview of the, the resources that we are we considered and analyzed and a, a little snapshot of the mitigation measures that we are starting to put into place. So the full analysis, again, sounding like broken record, but the full analysis can be found in the EA document. So at this time, I'm going to turn it back to Jonathan to discuss the next step in our planning process and facilitate the question and answer, answer session. All right, thank you, Erin, and thank you, Bri. Before we move forward with design or begin construction on any of the improvements that you saw in the presentation, it's important that we have your feedback about them. The National Park Service will then review, analyze, and consider all of your comments, and we will prepare to release a final document in response to those comments. So in order for you to make your comments, you can use the link that you can see on your screen and that we will populate in the chat to submit all of your input formally. So the open public comment period began on March 12th and it will close on April 10th. Please note that any questions or comments submitted during this webinar will not be considered formal comments on the project. That said, we're really glad to be able to have a direct conversation with all of you about your questions and concerns about this project. So we've received a number of questions that I am going to be reading back so that our subject matter experts can address each of them in turn. So they are questions about how these improvements will affect bicyclists, how they'll affect uh, traffic flow, and how they will how we will navigate through the process of ultimately determining how this process project will move forward or not. So uh, to begin, uh, one of one person asked uh, about the process that we are following to address um, this proposal. The question that was asked is, why is only one action alternative being considered on this project? And the response that we would share to that would be that uh, we always consider a variety of alternatives and we package them in the environmental assessment. Erin, would you be able to address a little bit more about the way that we formulate this process? Sure, I'd be happy to, and I'll ask Bri to step in uh, if I if I get too too far off off track. But um, when we go through an EA process, we analyze or we consider, I should say, even before we get to the EA process, we start to consider a variety of alternatives because I think it's important to understand that all we've done at that point, you know, early on in the process, is identify a problem that we need to solve. So we we start to sort of throw. Um, potential ideas at it to see, see what works. And then we go through, um, in some cases, we might go through a fairly intensive design process. We work with various stakeholders and we get information and we try to come up with the best solution that we, the best practical solution that we think will work um, considering all of the resources, all of the needs, all of the various uh, interests that are at stake. So, in, in this example, so we've, we've come to you with both a no action alternative and then an action alternative. And in that action alternative, we package together a bunch of really um, small, some small, some medium, some large individual actions that we could sort of uh, break up or not include kind of depending on funding or time or, or all those kinds of things. What I think is important to note right now though, is that this meeting, our coming to you and asking for your comments is part of our design, it's part of our problem solving, it's part of figuring out what that preferred alternative should look like. So sometimes we, we might encounter a project or a need or a problem that requires many different types of alternatives. In this one, we're hoping that we're capturing all of the needs inside one action alternative, but we really need your comments and your feedback to help guide and refine uh, that, that alternative. So I hope that answers the question and I haven't just confused it more. Um, I don't know if Jonathan or Brian have more to add on that topic. 
Thanks, Aaron. I'd be glad to add a little more detail to this particular project. Um, approximately two years ago, uh, Zion had a similar public meeting uh, wherein we presented um, an overall design concept plan for uh, this and the south entrance area as a whole. And we received public comments during that period. Uh, so we, as Aaron mentioned, gathering information and input from a variety of sources also included uh, many, many input items from the public during that time and, and since as we process through, as Aaron, um, as Aaron mentioned, um, a variety of ideas, a variety of alternatives, um, and uh, went through a, um, a, uh, an initial, what we call a value analysis period where we assess the, um, the ideas in a way that verifies and validates requirements uh, from a variety of um, imposing regulations, um, policies, and um, uh, operational requirements here in the park um, to meet. And that has led us to what you saw here tonight in the preferred alternative, which is a combination of a variety of inputs, um, including from the public. So I just wanted to add that in. All right, thank you for addressing that. Rye, thank you for addressing that, Aaron, again. I'm going to be packaging a few of the other questions that we've received together so that we can get through this um, in a way that we're able to address as many questions as possible. But we received several questions that had to do with parking. And Bri, these are questions that I hope you can address. Um, I'm going to read all of them and then I will give a quick redux. So the questions that were submitted were, how many additional visitor parking spaces will be created with this project? About how many large vehicle spaces will be created with the expanded lot? And a commenter mentioned that um, these are great improvements, especially the underpass to the Perus Trail, but I'm not understanding that large vehicles are a primary problem. It seems like all the cars are a major problem. Are there any plans to help with the car parking problem? And then another commenter said, could the employee parking area be used for overflow visitor parking? So, Bri, to the overall question here, would you be able to address uh, how this project is going to change visitor parking? Uh, certainly, Jonathan, and I'll uh, give also an opportunity for Superintendent Brady Baugh to um, make some comments if he chooses after after uh, my attempt to answer those questions. So I'll start with the last, and that's the employee, the question about the employee parking area, the proposed expansion of that employee parking area. And I will tell you that um, as of today, um, the expansion of that employee parking area is constrained to meet only our employee um, and shuttle bus uh, concessionaire employee needs. So there's not any, um, any real room in that proposed employee parking area for the visiting public uh, to park in that area. Likewise, it's also constrained um, in as far as access to the visiting public. There's, there's not um, uh, easy flow um, or um, a flow that's conducive for visitors to um, traverse through that parking area and look for parking spots anyway. And that's, that's uh, in, an intentional design to um, ensure that we have adequate and only adequate um, parking for employees. To the overall question, uh, parking in general, uh, I'll liken this to um, 
the uh, kind of the general context of the park and visitation overall. And uh, with our with our infrastructure, there's a there's a fine balancing act between uh, providing uh, access and and a, a good visitor experience to the to the public with um, our requirements to minimize the hard what we call the hard surfaces to our landscape area um, the visitor parking the visitor center uh, parking lot is not expanded under the uh, preferred alternative um, but there will be a, a small number of parking spaces that become available to the visiting public because there's no there is no need at uh, in the preferred alternative for employees in any way shape or form to park in that area um, except for just a few minutes uh, for a couple of spaces um, in that visitor center parking area overall um, we we tend to say to ourselves here in the in the park service, we we can't build our way out of of that particular problem, as the as folks may have experienced, um, especially during the high visitation summer months, where there are so many cars in the park, um, it would take the entire south entrance landscape um, to be paved in order to make an effort toward accommodating all of the visitors on any given day. So with that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pause and we'll see if uh, Superintendent Brady Baugh would like to add to that. Hey, thanks, Brian. I think that's a good explanation. Um, relative to the employee parking area, of course, um, we have various shifts that, that folks work, um, whether they're in the visitor center um, or with our, um, our cooperators, Zion Forever project working in the visitor center and also our, our shuttle um, operators. So we wanted to make that area um, less of a conflict um, zone and uh, and set that up um, so that we had efficiency there with our with our staff and our cooperator staff. One thing that's absolutely essential and has been, um, as many of you know, since we implemented the shuttle system back in 2000, is working together with the town of Springdale, um, stakeholders in the community, uh, some private businesses that have, in, have incorporated parking areas uh, with UDOT when they um, reconstructed Highway 9 uh, in Springdale. Uh, there was a lot of attention to parking, and um, we appreciate that and, and how we operate our, our shuttle system both in town and in the park is, is critical uh, that those things um, line up, fit together, and that we also consider, you know, what is our capacity for parking, the turnover rate um, in parking, all those types of things. So um, those are all considered as part of this planning and also part of our overall visitor use management. Thanks. All right, well, in the interest of making sure that we address as many questions as possible, I'm going to be packaging a few questions that we received now that have to do with the Peruse Trail, pedestrian access, and bicycle access. So I will be giving all of the questions and followed by a short, um, kind of, again, redux of what we were asked. And the questions that were asked were, are there any bicycle only routes or paths in the alternative B design where pedestrians and bicycles are separated, not commingled on the same path? Depending on the width of the mixed use path under the proposed new bridge, there may still be significant conflicts between bicycles and pedestrians. Another person asks, 
Can you illustrate how a hiker or biker would go from the visitor center to the Perus Trail? It looks like the underpass is on the south side of the river only. Another person asks, how will a bicyclist get from the visitor center to the Perus Trail, which is on the other side of the river? And last, someone asks, can you please describe the route a bicycle would take from Springdale, the town, through the entrance station, up the canyon to the Temple of Sinawaba? So regarding each of these questions, while we will not be going over things outside of the south entrance area, so we're not able to show the entire path that a cyclist would take from town in order to get up Canyon, the general question here that, Rai, if you can address, please, would be to talk a little bit about bicycle and pedestrian traffic and how this project would affect uh, travel around the south entrance area. Uh, certainly, uh, Jonathan. Um, so vi just very briefly, uh, the intention is uh, under this preferred alternative is to continue providing access to cyclists and pedestrians uh, on the uh, existing pedestrian bridge, which is located in the lower Zion Canyon Village area. Uh, pedestrians and cyclists um, could then um, uh, continue on a 10 foot wide uh, sidewalk uh, after that fee station, that pedestrian entrance fee station. Um, and in this particular case, they would continue that, that sidewalk would continue under the uh, bridge, uh, yes, only on that one side of the river. And then as you come out from under the bridge, uh, you would circle to the right and make a button hook to the right, if you will, and then get on to the, uh, the new bridge, which includes that uh, uh, dedicated pedestrian and cyclist uh, portion which if memory serves, um, we're uh, proposing a, it's either 10 or 12 foot, I think it's 12 feet wide um, to provide for that portion of multimodal traffic. So, um, you know, Zion uh, is, we've made our best effort to address as best we can, the uh, multimodal portion that's non-vehicular with as little uh, conflict opportunity as we can provide here in the park. Um, once those visitors, whether they're pedestrians or cyclists, cross over the bridge, then that's how they gain access to the Peru's Trail. Uh, I hope that I've, I've done the best I can uh, to describe that uh, verbally, um, and perhaps uh, we might find an opportunity to um, uh, provide cursor access. I could I could walk people through that if time avails. So with that, Jonathan, um, I'll leave it back to you. Thank you, Brian. And a reminder for all attendees: this is a relatively short meeting for a very long document. And so we encourage you to take advantage of the fact that this document is posted for your perusal and then share detailed public comments with us so that we can consider them as we decide how to advance or how to manage this proposal going forward. Again, in the interest of time, another question that we received is how many accidents occur annually between vehicles, vehicles and bicycles, vehicles and pedestrians, bicycles and pedestrians in the south entrance or visitor center area. The statistic that we have in our environmental assessment is that we recorded nine vehicle crashes in this area in the period between 2018 and 2023. And we will certainly consider uh, going forward uh, the kind of information that you're asking about. Looking at the other kinds of information that we are considering here. We received a question about um, possible flooding 
in the proposed project area? And this will be a question that I hope Aaron can address. The question that was asked is, what alternate plans do you have for the under Peru's pedestrian bike trail, which appears to be in the existing floodplain when it floods? That is such a good question. So something that I think is really neat that I've uh, been able to see just in, in my time in the National Park Service over the last uh, decade and a half or so is that we're doing a lot, we're doing a much better job of designing our infrastructure with regard to resiliency and sustainability in a time of pretty dynamic weather and climate conditions that we're, we're seeing. So this pathway is actually designed to be flooded. So we're taking the fact that it is in the floodplain into consideration and trying to design it to be a resilient structure. So there are uh, there's riprap and boulders uh, that are engineered into the plan to keep that trail surface stable and in place. Um, it, it will function actually very similar if you're familiar with the under bridge a uh, section of the Peruse that goes under the bridge by Canyon Junction uh, at the at about the intersection of the, the scenic drive and Zion Mount Carmel Highway. So it, it is a it is a surface that's designed to take on water and, and stand up to flood floodwaters. But an, another important mechanism, another important mitigation, I guess, is that we of course want to take into consideration that there could be people on those on that part of the trail during flood events. So our plan uh, to mitigate that danger is to put up signage, making sure that people are informed um, that they're in a flash flood area and providing information uh, for, for just situational awareness for visitors. So I hope that kind of answers the question. We, we completely understand that it's probably odd to folks to, to be building this in, in a known floodplain, um, but we still think given those factors, we think it's still one of the better options in terms of reducing other harmful effects to visitors from like interacting with shuttles and, and uh, bicycle, other, bi you know, e-bikes and, and things like that. It's, it's kind of nice to give folks a dedicated space away from the motorized vehicles. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers answers the question well, well enough on that front. Thank you, Erin. We got a question asking whether there is the question is, will the current pedestrian entrance move? The short answer to that is that is not in the scope of the proposal for this project. So it's not something that we are considering at this time. It's something that we would possibly consider in the future. Another question I believe it would be for Bry would be, would it be difficult for large RVs, trailers, or vehicles to navigate around roundabouts? Or if we've lost Bri, which it appears we may have an internet problem. I am uh, I am now no. back online. Um, <laughs> there we go. I had a problem with the uh, the controls. Um, the answer, the short answer to that question is no. These traffic circles um, are designed to accommodate uh, large, up to large tractor trailer rigs. And the reason for that primarily at that first roundabout is the scenario where um, an oversized vehicle that uh, entered the park or, or wants to go through the park, um, ha we have in the park our uh, historic uh, Zion Mount Carmel Highway uh, tunnel, and that has size and weight and height requirements. Uh, and so sometimes those vehicles are just not able to uh, continue on their intended path and need to be turned around. Uh, and that is accommodated in that very first traffic circle. So that kind of gives you a, a sense of the scale of that traffic circle um, to be able to accommodate that size of vehicle. The um, traffic circle, uh, uh, nearer the Watchman uh, campground can also accommodate up to our 60-foot articulated buses 
So again, although it appears smaller on the graphic that you're viewing, uh, very large vehicles can uh, negotiate that traffic circle as well. All right, thank you, Bri. Um, one more question for you, Bri. Uh, the question that we were asked is, don't shuttles still have to cross traffic under alternative B? So I think a way of packaging this would be to say, can you just explain the, the benefits in terms of traffic flow regarding shuttles um, for the way that the road layout would change? Uh, certainly. So uh, I believe you're now able to see my cursor on the screen. Um, and there's a, there's so many different scenarios, but I will I will point to the foremost situation where shuttle buses uh, do need to cross vehicular traffic pathways. And that's when they come out of the shuttle facility down here, uh, they come into this right lane and they, they exit through this right lane, which is kind of hard to see on the screen. And they, they bypass the traffic circle and they're in the rightmost lane. And if they need to immediately uh, enter the visitor center shuttle stop, uh, which they often do at this point, they need to cross into the left exiting lane and continue to this point and then make a left turn. Uh, that is the point where uh, this shuttle would be, could be somewhat delayed with that incoming traffic. Um, our design details uh, uh, include the addressing this situation with the two exit lanes. So while that shuttle is paused to make a left-hand turn there, tr other traffic can flow around on the, in the rightmost lane past that shuttle, preventing a, a backup um, toward the traffic circle behind that shuttle. That's one aspect of this left turn right in this area here. Um, as far as the oncoming traffic, uh, there is some contemplation on other traffic uh, indicators being provided for that uh, incoming traffic, such as yield to left turning buses through this area here. So uh, as we get, uh, you know, should, should we get positive feedback from the public, uh, good comments like this one in the, in the formal format, uh, we will take a closer look at that. But that is the current plan right now. That left turn can be negotiated uh, easily as far as um, physical space for the shuttle bus to turn left. Um, and uh, we can control the traffic with signage um, and uh, markings on the uh, asphalt to indicate to incoming traffic to yield to left turning shuttles. All right, thank you for laying that out, Bri. While you have your cursor on screen, can you also please uh, show the path for pedestrians and bicyclists under the bridge to access the Bruce Trail? Yes, um, thank you, Jonathan. As I mentioned before, those pedestrians and cyclists would um, come into the Lower Zion Canyon Village area and cross over, or, uh, cross over the pedestrian bridge, which I think is just outside the, oh, it's right in this area here. Uh, and that's existing. And the uh, fee station to enter the park is here. And that provides a safe access for both pedestrians and cyclists, um, especially cyclists, versus negotiating the roadway 
up in this area where the vehicular fee stations are. Um, and that's uh, an invitation for uh, uh, cyclists and vehicles uh, to uh, come into conflict. And we did explore, uh, based on public input previously, a dedicated uh, cyclist lane in this area. And we concluded that there's just not uh, uh, enough physical space to, uh, to provide that type of entry for cyclists separate from pedestrians. So back to the pathway, entering the uh, fee station area here, and then those uh, pedestrians and cyclists can come up this. Um, you see in the very slight uh, marking of a of a pathway here. This this pathway exists now, uh, and those cyclists can come uh, this way and traverse this pathway leading up to um, eventually the underpass coming under the bridge, and you see the path loops around to their right and then loops to their right again and crosses over that dedicated space on the bridge and then to the Perus Trail in that manner. I just quickly also note that um, the large vehicle parking area, um, pedestrians needing to get to the visitor center um, can now enter on this side of the parking area, taking the same pathway under the bridge to get safely to the visitor center area over here. All right, thank you, Bri. We have two more questions that I think can be best addressed by Aaron, and these will be the last two that we address this evening. And those two questions are, how long will each of the phases take? Will there be future phases? And what is the estimated cost for the preferred design? Aaron, would you be able to give a little bit of more background on the EA process and everything that we're trying to accomplish here? Sure, of course. So the, the short and maybe unsatisfying answer is that we, we don't really have answers to these questions just yet. Uh, because we're still in the planning phase of the project and we're in this EA process where we're asking for your feedback, we really need to get your information before we can start to delve into timelines, cost estimates, all of that kind of stuff. We, we don't want to, to do anything um, without making sure that we're, or we don't want to, to be presumptive and, and start to make, make assumptions about timelines or costs without making sure that we're getting the public's input first. So hopefully, uh, hopefully once this public comment period ends, and we get all of your wonderful feedback and comments, we'll be able to incorporate those and then have a little bit better sense of how long things will take and how much it will cost. Um, so I'm sure that, that Brian and his team who are working uh, on, the, on the design have, have some sense of, of just generally how long construction projects take, but we really wanna make sure that we're, we're getting all of your feedback and incorporating it so that we have a really solid final design before we start to make uh, even educated guesses about those those two uh, elements, I guess. So, sorry, it's probably not very satisfying, but that's the, the actual answer. All right, well, thanks to Aaron, thanks to Bri, thanks to our superintendent, Jeff Brady Baugh, and all of you for making time to be here this evening. It's been great to be able to share some information with you about this project. And we wanna make sure that we get all of your input just as Aaron said, before we move forward. So remember, public comment began on March 12th and it will close on April 10th. We need you to share your comments online. That's the best way to get to us. And we'll consider all comments before we move forward with the project or before we finalize the proposal. So we appreciate all of the time that you've taken to be here. We look forward to reading your formal comments and we look forward to seeing you here in Zion National Park. Have a nice evening.